Gig Gab, the show for working musicians. The episode today, for today, easy for me to say, is Monday, January 3rd, 2022. Happy New Year, folks. folks and welcome to welcome back to gig gab happy new year we are the show by for and about working musicians working when we can anyway here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in napomo california it's paul kent happy new year mr kent happy new year dr hamilton how was your uh, how was your holiday <laughs> it's good i'm not a doctor though but uh you, you know. just play one play one behind the drum kit i try to play one sometimes that's right yeah exactly yeah no my um my new year's eve was we i think i mentioned last week in fact i'm almost certain i did that we didn't have a gig because covid was kind of a problem and uh and it was just fine. New Year's is not my favorite night to play. In fact, I would prefer not to play on New Year's. People get sloppy and people get um, and, and that sloppiness sort of permeates the entire evening, including but not limited to the people on the road when I have to drive home after the gig. So I'm, I'm always kind of happy to be home on New Year's, although it often happens that the right gig comes up and of course I'll do it, but I do not seek out new year's gigs. Maybe that's a, a good way to do it. A good way to say it. But when, yeah, yeah. when the right one comes to me, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Usually this, this year we, um, our friend, I actually, I had an inspiration from cover band confidentials, Adam Johnson. He and his, and his wife posted about how they made beef Wellington for, for I think it was Christmas dinner or maybe it was Boxing Day dinner or something like that, and I sh the pictures looked delicious and so I shared that with my family and we decided sure let's do that for New Year's Eve. So it was a it was a podcast inspired uh, thing. We we prepared the Wellington, which is a massive pain in the neck, uh, right. as a project on Thursday night and then we just cooked it on Friday night. And while it didn't look quite as good as Adams. It was delicious and it was fun. It was a fun little project. We we cooked it while we watched, cooked it and ate it while we watched uh, Fish's live stream. Uh, they they canceled all their Madison Square Garden shows for uh, New Year's this year because also because of COVID and uh, and so. But they did play a show to no in person audience live stream to what looked like it was about 75,000 people, 75,000 screens on YouTube. And I think another 75,000 on like Sirius and live fish. So um, perhaps the biggest audience they've ever streamed to, but, um, but it was nice. It was a, it was a, you know, they were interacting with the crowd via the chat and stuff, which um, Trey Anastasio had gotten good at when he did his beacon jam thing about yeah. a year ago. So it was, it was actually really a nice night. We played some games, and uh, and just hung out, and so to have New Year's at home with my family was was totally fine. But you you That's played, cool. yeah, it was cool. It, it was nice. It was. It's been a, it's been a crazy couple of months. Um, really, the last month, um, especially you know, just dragging this deal that we did with the Mac Observer across the finish line, and um, and we got it there, and had finally told the staff about it. The, the um, for those of you that don't follow me elsewhere on social media. We, um, the site that I started 23 years ago, the Mac observer was acquired. And, uh, so we got the deal across the finish line, got it closed. And then finally on the 29th, we told the staff about it, which was, I think 23 years to the day wow. since we launched it, which was just interesting. So it was a lot and it was nice to just kind of breathe after that. Oh, I'm sure. Well, chill with the family. So. Yeah, it was good. First of all, as I told you offline, but I'll tell you again in front of everybody, uh, congratulations. You know, Mac Observer meant so much to so many people over the years. And so I, I'm sure there was a lot of emotion going by. But, you know, I think change is good. And, yeah. you know, moving forward into the future is good for you. And so I think you're going to I think you're going to be on to great things here, Dave. I, I thank you. And I agree with you. I am stoked, in fact, about the future of the Mac Observer. I'm stoked about the future of me. It like this was the I think the best thing that could have happened for the site to be perfectly Good. frank. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And to have 
uh, Sir Hot Kurt, Doctor Sir Hot Kurt. So there's your doctor um, to have him in charge of the site. <laughs> He's a PhD. He he actually asked me to stop calling him doctor. So I I will I will refrain. But Sir Hot is uh, you know he's been a fan of the site for a long time and he. Uh, he really is like eager to to you know pour his heart and soul into it and and drive it into the future and I I'm I'm stoked for everybody involved uh, including him and everybody in the staff and I think Very it's going to be great yeah I know it, it's yeah. it's a wonderful thing and like you said change is good um, but I'll still be doing my Mac Geek Gab podcast and uh, on my own separate from Mac Observer and then obviously you and I keep doing this here. You know, it's Absolutely. all good. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, I think about New Year's Eve. I've actually seen a lot of people say, oh, it's amateur night. I'm a professional. I don't go out on amateur night and you know, all sorts of things. But the other thing is, like, early on, remember, I, I have five horns who yeah. um, are, you know, they're working musicians. And just basically, New Year's Eve is one of the big money nights of the year if you're a musician. You're going to work and you're going to get paid and, you know, those types yeah, of things. And so, for sure. you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at maximizing revenue opportunities, you work on New Year's Eve. We've worked probably probably half the New Year's Eves over the years. I, I think that's I'll say that's true right. unless you happen to play New Year's Eve gigs at a theater, in which case the, the money isn't really any, any better than any other night. Uh, <laughs> But, but you're, no, you're totally, you're totally right that like that it is a, a generally speaking, a well-paid night. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the house rockers had a new year's Eve gig. It's a gig where I signed a three year deal, uh, mm. four years ago. Uh, we did the first one and it was fun. And the second one got coveted out. And then this was the third one. And, um, it's an outdoor gig, which, uh, of course, you know, temperature relative things, you're saying, what's the big deal? You're in California, but it does rain and it is pretty cold. So uh, it was always, it's kind of a weird thing, but the first year we did it, I don't know. It's just kind of like everybody was bundled up and, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, people, people go to Times Square for New Year's Eve. I mean, that's way colder. And the audience was bundled up. The band, you know, after about three songs, your body temperature kind of goes through the roof and, you know, yep. you're feeling all right. Yep. Uh, it, for us, it's kind of an interesting thing that, that in extreme weather, the horns go out of tune in one direction and strings go out of tune in the other direction. So it's a constant battle all night of trying to find each other in the middle somewhere. Yeah, so it was, that, that was always a thing when when I played in the, when I played in the school band, which had no strings. It wasn't as much of an issue because everything sort of, you know, like like you said, it all went in the same direction. Uh, when I played in the orchestra which all, which had a mix of strings and and horns it was always a mess if we were playing yeah. something where the temperature was you know fluctuating or cold or whatever but yeah 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 i forgot about that that's right yeah so we yeah. played 915 to 1215 two okay. sets with the countdown it was 45 degrees at downbeat it got down to about 41 or 42 at its coldest and Ooh. and yeah, that's 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 cool, right? That's chilly. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, but, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, hand, we I bought hand warmers for everybody. Nice. Uh every, the guys knew the drill cuz we played it once before. Right. They were bundled up. Um a lot of uh, a lot of long underwear underneath <laughs> layers and stuff. Um but I will tell you that the MVP of the night as is most nights is our guy Bill, so our sound guy who's really to say sound guy is just way understates what he does. So, right. Sure. So he, you know, he, he, he and he had uh, a great helper this year, um, our friend Mickey Hall. And so uh, Bill gets there, you know, four or five hours in advance. We walk in, the stage is ready to go. It is awesome. So it's amazing. Um, but Bill does stuff like this, like in, in the summer gigs, he will stock a cooler with, um, with, uh, with iced down cloths for us and that type of thing. And just, Above and beyond, you know, what a sound guy does. Yeah. And then for this, he stocked, a, so he works at a Togo's. He manages a Togo's sandwich restaurant. He brought in dinner, sandwiches, cookies, chips. He stocked a bar for us. He brought in a hot coffee maker for us. I mean, talk about little touches that make you feel special. So I, I'm, I am purposely spending some time because Bill just blows me away. His attention to detail how much he wants us to be successful, how much he, you know, looks at his job as as a desire to do everything possible to make the whole enterprise, you know, more professional, mm. more comfortable, give better shows. So hat hat tip to Bill. Um 
Yeah. I mean, it's just, that was great. So anyway, that's uh, awesome. we're there. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a, a magic show for a couple hours on the same stage before us. So we get set up, got done about right about quarter to seven. So I think we loaded in at five, sound check at six. We went through a couple songs that we were going to play that night. Guys were well prepared and we knocked them out. Um, it was funny. One of them, there was a goof by the horns and the horns were reading charts. So, you know, we get through the song, like, how did all five of you guys goof this in the same way? And he, <laughs> he got, and you know, Mendoza looks at me and he says, you know, better now than in the show, it won't happen in the show. And that sure enough, it didn't happen in the show. That's great. So yeah. Um, the show, so uh, we were hanging around for two hours. I think one or two guys might've gone home for a little bit. Um, again, the sandwiches were there. It, it was a beautiful park setting with a bunch of exhibits, Christmas exhibits. So some people had their families and they walked around. The crowd kind of came and went over time. And uh, I thought one of three things. One, just about every indoor thing in this area got shut down in the last week. Yep. Interestingly enough, by the clubs, not by the county. So so I was just seeing daily club bands I knew saying, oh, our, you know, our gig is canceled. Yeah. So that was the I'm same. Figuring. It was the same here. It was just like left and right. People were right. like, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it was this Omicron surge. Nobody really wanted to be the ones to test these theories. I, I want to talk a little bit about those theories in a minute here, um, mostly for my own therapy. But uh, but yeah, I saw the same thing here. It was just like every New Year's gig was just like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we were outdoors. So I'm thinking, well, maybe – all those people are going to come outdoors who wanted to go to a New mm -hmm. Year's Eve thing. So that, so that was that was possibility one. Possibility two was that nobody was going to come because nobody wanted to be around a crowd. Possibility three was all those indoor people would come and it'd be so many people that they would just turn around and leave. You'd again, have a problem. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, it it ended up somewhere between number number one and number three, right? So so there were a lot of people there, um, but it didn't seem like the crowd was steady all night. And um, pretty big at, at the countdown. Um, That's good. And, and so, yeah. So anyway, it was good experience. You know, the band played great. We hadn't seen each other in about six weeks. And, you know, I always, I as a band leader, always, you know, want to bottle that good feeling when we have a good gig that, you know, kind of sustains us and links us together. And I always worry when there's long layoffs that it's going to take a long time to get it back. And I, I then am reminded that, well, you know, when we came back from basically a year off during COVID, we kind of hit the ground running right away. We we're so happy to play together. So even though um, even though there seems to be with my move more time that may go by at times between when we see each other, yeah. it seems like the one of the one of the benefits you get of a band being together as long as we have is you do pick it up right where you were and and that that good feeling kind of kind of kicks right in. That's great. I'm glad to hear that, man. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad the gig went well. I'm glad the gig went. You were you were one of the few who actually was able to play this New Year's. So there you go. That's good, man. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I think I think uh, it was New Year's gigs are good things. I mean, I yeah. know, for I think they're they're good celebrations. The vibe is good as long as people aren't getting sloppy. Yeah. Uh, we and we have played ones where people got. Uh, icky you know the yeah. people really you know were behaving badly as we like to say um <laughs> it's a, ni that's a nice way to put it that's right yes. yeah but we've had more that you know people get dressed up and they're out out with their yeah. you know their special person and you know and it's there's i think especially this year there's a lot of uh looking forward you know in hope that next year will be better and i certainly as a musician i'm hoping next year will be better i mean you know we're we're about to settle in for a long cold winter uh, cause we're still not really taking indoor gigs. Um, so I think, you know, we have a little plan for what we're going to do with our time in terms of rehearsals, but not a lot of gigs, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking until March. Yeah. Interesting. So that, I wanted to have, th this is the conversation I kind of wanted to open up is this idea of a long, cold winter, this idea of no gigs. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm having a lot of different thoughts about it which on the surface would seem like conflicted thoughts but you know they're all coming from the same brain so i don't know what that tells you but um we do have a gig a bitter pill gig scheduled for indoor gig for uh january 22nd at flight coffee where we've played before and when i realized this morning it was on the calendar i actually i i messaged in our group about it 
you know, just to confirm, like, is this still on? Because it was put on there, I think, back in September or something, right? So, you know, things are different now than than we predicted they would be in, you know, when we were looking at this in September. And it was like, yeah, it's still on the calendar. Now, you, you know, if anybody in the band is uncomfortable or whatever, you know, we all prioritize each other's both physical and emotional safety and health and all of yeah. that. So, like, I have no doubt that if somebody was like, guys, I like this, this is this seems like a stupid idea. We'd probably pull the plug. No one has said that yet. It doesn't mean it won't happen. Um, and I don't think I will be the one, though I certainly would support it if somebody else did. Um I, I, I've gotten to the point. So actually last week I thought I had COVID. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't. I had, you know, I'm triple vaxxed and all that boosted and all that crap. And I had, you know, kind of the sniffles and a sore throat and a like a what I'll call a very mild cough. Like mild meaning I was coughing maybe three or four times a day. Right. So it was super mild. And if it weren't for all this Omicron stuff and people saying that those are exactly the symptoms that it starts with for them, I probably wouldn't have even thought anything about it. Um, I did. We did do some vocals in the studio and I was uh, n noticeably worse for wear than I was the the prior session we did vocals. with. <laughs> but um, but thankfully, between Billy and Chris, our engineer, I, I made it through. And I think we've got takes that that'll work fine. You know, it's just harmony. So you can kind of bury him a little bit. Which is great, yeah. but um, but you know, I definitely had something going on. I I but I have had three COVID tests, including one PCR test, um, throughout uh, that was several days after whatever those symptoms were began, and I, you know they all came back negative. So I have to assume that I did not have COVID, right? Um, but it was an interesting sort of exercise to go through because I know lots of people who are in the same boat, you know, triple vaxxed and boosted or whatever you want to call it, and had those same symptoms or no symptoms and yet wound up testing positive when they did their surveillance testing ahead of, you know, getting together for Christmas or New Year's with family or whatever it was. And it's like, OK, you know, part of me was like, OK, great. You know, I, I this is what it's going to be and it's mild and got it over with and moved past it. And even though that's not what actually happened to me last week, it's, it's reasonable to presume that that's, that's what would happen. And so at this point, I'm, I'm not all that concerned about being exposed. There are times where I will choose to wear a mask. We are, we do not have a mask mandate in the state of New Hampshire here. Um, so I, you know, so we don't have to wear masks pretty much anywhere. There's some some stores that will put a sign up and request it. And of course, you know, I'm totally fine wearing it if if requested. And I will even wear it at times when not requested. Like for some reason, when I go to the grocery store, I, I like I just always put on a mask and it's it's mm -hmm. it's my thing. It's and it, I'm fine. It's it, but it's definitely for my comfort, you know, again, unless somebody asked me to and then I'm happy to do it. We went to the Bruins game on Saturday and, you know, the um, I don't think it's all in Massachusetts. But certainly Boston has an indoor mask mandate. And so, you know, we had to wear masks in, in for the game and that was fine and uh, it was all good. But I, I'm really not that concerned. I'm not finding myself concerned about playing gigs indoors or outdoors. And maybe that's foolish of me, uh, you know, but I, it, I'm just noticing that it's like, yeah, I'll go do this gig at flight on the 22nd. That's fine. And part of it is that I'm way more comfortable about this because of you know, being vaccinated and seeing how mild this Omicron thing is for most vaccinated people. I realize there's no guarantees one way or another, but the other part is I know what it did to me, not getting out and interacting with humans for so long. And, and that's also a dangerous path. And so it's like, yeah, I think it's okay. Mm. And, I, and, and again, I mean, I, I say this and I'm, I'm talking to myself. This is, this is just therapy here. I'm not, I'm not proselytizing. I'm not preaching what anybody else should be doing. Although I am inviting uh, feedback either from you here right now or from, you know, our listeners feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'm, I'm happy to have people tell me I'm being stupid um, or not, or missing something or whatever, but I'm, I'm not worried about playing gigs. Um, I may choose to wear a mask, you know, if, if the vibe makes me want to wear a mask or again, if the club, asked us to, that would be fine. But otherwise, yeah, I think I'm okay interacting yeah. with people. Yeah. And I hear that a lot. I, I yeah. heard that from a couple of guys in my bands. I think, huh, 
it is the Uber problem, right? It is the question of whether we are doing things to continually perpetuate this, that even though we might not get sick, we might give it to someone else who might get really sick sure. or will be part of the process that, that will overload hospitals, which seems to be a real concern again right now because the sheer number of transmissions that are going on right, right. now. So, right. But most of know, those hospitalizations are not people in the, in the you know, vaccinated group. Right. Some of them are. I understand. But that's what I'm saying is that yeah. we're going to go out and play. And, you know, the people who clearly feel that they don't need to be vaccinated are certainly going to feel that they're OK sure. to be around other people. That's right. And they're the people who are in the mix of all this transmission issues. So. So, yeah, I, you know, it really becomes a, a question. I I hear you, now you, it's interesting what you say to me because I'm you, so you've moved your line a little bit over time with a For little sure. bit more information. You know, right. Yeah. And um, uh, the sax player in my band when when. It was really hard about four months in, so, you know, middle to late summer 2020. And I was like, oh, man, you know, should we should we get together and rehearse and find some way to do it, like, at a, at a large distance? And, and he yeah. was like, you know what? Our generation has not been asked to sacrifice anything in my lifetime. This is not like a World War II, you know, type yep. of thing where, right? And so if I have to stay in my freaking house for a couple of years, I'm not – worried about that. I'm not thinking about the long-term emotional effects. Yes, it's hard, but you know, in terms of people who have had it really hard over yeah, time, yeah. this is not that, you know, and and that rings in one of my ears as well. Um I mostly observe that the world seems to be playing kind of ethical gymnastics on types of things, right? Uh not not facetious, not, you know, evil. Yeah. But people are doing what you're kind of doing. It's like, well, you know what? That really sucked. And 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 that has a different effect on me. And now I got to add that into the equation. And, you know, I probably won't get sick. And, you know, but I'm on the stage. It's not my problem what goes on in the audience. And, you know, all sorts of kind of positioning of things to get to a place where you can make your own personal decision. And I guess that makes sense. That's how we yes. make many decisions. Yeah, well, it and it, be a harder it, one, though. it got to the point for me where I, I wound up having so much anxiety over what other people were doing. Like, you know, I'd go to the store or wherever, it didn't matter, you know, and I'd see somebody without a mask or wearing their mask, like a chin diaper, you know, whatever. And it would freak right. me out and like all of that stuff. And I finally, I had to get to the other side of that again, just for my own emotional health. I've, I am super fortunate. I have never experienced anything that I would have called anxiety. Now, some people may, you know, <laughs> may take issue with that and say, well, you know, if you look back, maybe, maybe you have had these problems over time, but you know, I've, I've always been able to just kind of make it through. Right. And, and for a variety of reasons, the COVID lockdown uh, caused me to experience some of that uh, enough that I, I have a lot more empathy for people who experience what I would call chronic anxiety. Again, as we stipulated at the beginning of the episode, I am no doctor. I'm just a human. And I tend to be an uh, empathic one at that um, sometimes to my own detriment, but it's a good thing. Uh, and so because of this, you know, I had to get over that, which I cannot control, meaning other people. And it got to the point where it was like, okay, if I'm going to leave the house, the only person I can control is me. And, 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 and sometimes that might mean, well, today I'm not going to leave the house, right? Like that, that's part of that control. But if I'm going to go out, you know, we were at the Bruins game this weekend, by and large, actually, from what I noticed, most people were wearing their masks, but there were some people that weren't. It was like, you know what? That's fine. I'm not going to worry about them. I have a mask that, you know, I wear the KF94 masks that have the filtration in both directions and all of that. Have I, you know, sat down with scientists and tested the ones that I actually get? No. Uh, have they worked thus far for us? Yes. Does that mean that they will always work? Probably not. No. You know, yeah. but like, it, it, you know, like, it, but I, I'm, I'm doing things. I had to get to a point where the only person I was worrying about was what I was doing. And, and maybe that extends to the family. Like we all, we all talk with each other. When th those of us that live in a house together, talk with each other about that, which we're doing to make sure no one in the house is super uncomfortable about, you know, somebody going out. Like, if, like if I were playing this gig and Lisa was like, well, I'm not really comfortable with you playing a gig. Well, then that actually matters. Right. You, you know, matters. 
Yeah, yeah, because we got to be able to live together and and we have to be able to have those conversations. Just like if she wants to go to the gym and work out, you know, are, are we okay with that? That kind of thing, right? Yeah. And so we have those conversations. But other than other than that, the you know the the control that we do have over the people, it, at least in my family in our in our household, I'm I'm kind of over it. I and because I have to be for my own sanity. And, and so that's kind of where I've gotten to. And, and like you said, there's the people that, that aren't comfortable getting a vaccine for whatever reason. Um, and, and some of them who've, whose doctors have told I me, mean, it doesn't matter. Right. But you know, they, they also can choose not to go out if they are concerned about th- getting exposed by being in a group of people and all of that. And it's been made very clear to me that that's just how it's going to be. And so, uh, so I've accepted that for better or for worse, but it's yep. like, you know, that's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to change the subject on you. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, it is a long, cold winter ahead of us. Uh, no matter how much we play, it probably won't be a lot. You, you as well. Right. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't have like that. That's the one. Yeah. That's the gig. <laughs> All right. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, I get restless and bored. And I always, and, and, and actually say right now, I'm restless and bored, you know, being a cover musician, right? You know, we just played, you know, whatever, 35, 40 gigs since June. Uh, and we played pretty much a standard set list, you know, which is, was our kind of tact for coming out of sure. COVID is like, take our best stuff and put it, whereas before we would change up the set list a fair amount, you know, night to night. And so what are we going to do with our time moving forward? So uh, we're going to go back into our archives and, and bring out some of the stuff that we had liked to play in the past. Although I make the argument that if that stuff was that good, it would have it would have made it into the A list that we would have been playing already. So I'm, I'm you know <laughs> I'm kind of rationalizing that yeah, there's some good songs in there, but you know it's not as good as the stuff we have, and anything we add back into the show needs to be at least as good as what we're doing now because our show's doing pretty well right now. I, yeah, I'm with you on that. They, they, I guess, I suppose the the only question to ask is why is that song better now than it was then in relation right. to everything else, right? And you might have an answer for that. Like one of your horn players might say, well, we rearranged that song and it's got this new thing and we're doing a thing on stage that's really going to be entertaining. Like, ah, great. Okay, let's do. Let's that, try it out. That, you know. could, that could be an answer. I would say that sure. the, the first answer that is in practicality happening is we have them charted. We know them. We can dust them off and, you know, yeah. and take a look and, you know, see if we can get them up to speed. But it feels um, like you a, know, that feels like a mulligan. <laughs> right. That's how I and like I said, I'm bored to begin with. And so, yeah. you know, I want to do stuff. You know, I like these ticketed shows. I like these special shows. But, you know, time is a value. You know, we're, we don't have infinite time to put into stuff. But you ever get that way where like, you know, just the task of. Of, of playing a cover set feels like a grind to you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's an easy, when things are going well, crowds are good. Interaction is good. The band's on fire and you're in a, I'll call it a habit, right? Where you're, you're, you're in the, you're in the groove, right? And I don't just mean in the groove at the gig, but in the groove, you know, week to week, month to month, where you're just like, this is what we do. And we're doing it really well. And all of that stuff. It can be great. And, and, and then take a break from it as we all have at some level Mm -hmm. and look back and it's like, man, like that could, that was a grind. Like what, what was the point of all that again? Like, (laughs) so yes, I've, I've definitely had those moments and, and I, you know, I sometimes have those moments, especially at wedding gigs, which really are, I'm not, I, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to play in a cover band again, you know, on a regular basis going forward. But at, at this point, the original thing is is far more interesting to me. If the wedding band winds up actually, you know, pulling things together and getting some gigs, sure, I'll do those. Wedding, those are different kind of things, right? But but otherwise, if I'm going to go out or, or like what I did with Stu, where it, that that you know tribute night that was sort of carved out to be the special thing that Marvin Gaye thing. I think actually I do have one of those gigs coming up in March. Somebody booked another one. Like those are fine, but the the general just go to a bar and play cover songs all night. Um, yeah, I don't know. The I, work I, itself doesn't doesn't frustrate me more. Is like 
as like conceptualizing what can make it. What can make vibrant. it special. Yeah. 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 The actual playing and, you know, and the work that goes into, you know, getting to a gig and unpacking sure. and all that, 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 I have no issue with that. That's going to work and I'm good with that. Yep. It's Same. more like what, what, uh, what can be inspiring in this process? You know, we, we, we you know, we've been playing our, our, GB, you know, stuff for, for a while here. Right. Right. And it goes over and it's great. And in the moment it, it, it is great, but it's when you're off and you're thinking like, how do I take it to another level? And you're like, yeah, you know, what really would make it, would, would make the show pop. And that's where it feels a little endemically, I mean, it'd be not boring, just, um, you know, kind of stuck in the mud. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, I totally, totally get it. Yes. Like, like you're saying with the, the song list is, is really the the crux of that because you want to add new songs, but they have to be better or at least as good as the song right. it's replacing, right? And and we got to that point in Fling, and there were some some um, stylistic differences too. Some people wanted to play different types of music, and it was like, okay, well, we need to figure that out, but. By and large, the, it didn't matter what the style was. It, the question always was, well, if we're going to add that song, what song comes out? And, and, it, and it became that clear of a conversation. It was that explicit. Like, okay, I get that you have these four songs that you want us to put in the set and you think they're going to go over great. Great. Okay. Like, you might be right about that. I, you know, like, let's, let's test them. But you need to pick the four songs that are coming out so that those four songs can fit in it. Like mm -hmm. it's not up to some other power that be to do that. It is a zero sum game. There's X amount of time. And That's X it. Of songs. Yeah. Right. And, and it, you know, for a while it was, it was up to me to build the set list. And, and then I, I started getting a lot of crap about it to be perfectly frank. <laughs> I, and I didn't realize that it, it it's to say that I was getting crap about it is wrong. Nobody was really giving me crap about it, but what, what happened was I realized that not everyone was happy with all the songs that we were playing. And so right. it was like, oh, I mean, and ignorance was truly bliss on this uh, because we were just crunching along. Things were going. I was building the set list. We were putting together great shows. Crowds were happy. And then, you know, we took a little bit of a breath and it was obvious. Oh, wait a minute. Like the songs that I'm selecting to put on the set list through whatever my own criteria are aren't necessary. like we need to powwow a little bit and get on the same page. And, and when we did, it became this really, it, it spoiled it for me. Ignorance was bliss. Um, yep. And so, so it had to be, okay, if we're going to add those four, what are the four that are coming out? And, and let's talk that out, you, you know, let's, let, and it was a really difficult thing to do because well, the same conversation of, Ignorance is bliss. You, you are so right about that. Because <laughs> if I was to ask the guys, you know, why does our show work? Or what do we need to do to take it to the, uh, to the next level? One guy will be like, we'll work on our vocals. One guy will be like, you know, more funk. Or one guy will be more rock. Or, sure. you know, like, yeah. like, you will get as many opinions as there are in the band. And that's... Sometimes more. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. My girlfriend said, we do this really well. Yeah. yeah you get that. So I, I think that... The core of the answer is to find something where the whole band is excited about it. That's right. It. So w once you've kind of built a show and you have an ongoing band and you know you you function for whatever whatever definition you would put on function, you you get gigs, you can do gigs, you you know don't kill each other, right? You're all some, <laughs> somewhat committed to continuing on. You've kind of done that work where everybody had a little bit of a say, and you know you you democratize the process. It seems like I know I have ideas. And when I float the ideas to kind of test them in the band, if I don't get, you know, a pretty good feeling that I'm going to have a, a you know, at least critical mass of, of, uh, of support on it, it's pretty exhausting to try and, you know, slam my ideas over. Like that, that's not yeah. one I typically would play a leader card on and say my idea for what you're going to do with your time because it's so unsatisfying play something knowing that a guy's looking down at his shoes because he really didn't want to do it is that's, you know, that feels like a growing cancer possibility, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I think yeah. that that's the thing is to, is to figure out how to have that conversation where, um, 
you can isolate the opportunity for grievances to air and focus in on and focus in on you know some kind of common denominator that everybody can be excited of it's one we, of the things i like about playing in uh, original bands all, not, not that original bands are immune to this i mean we all just watched and talked about the beatles thing where you know, as soon as George Harrison started to have a songwriting voice, there was no he realized there was no room for that in the Beatles. And that became a little bit of a problem. Right. But it, you know, like like with both Fling and Bitter Pill right now, putting out new material and we're all sort of focused on not just sort of we are focused on that. And that's the new thing. Right. And and the argument about why would we add, you know, this new song to the set list as, as opposed to keeping the old ones is because, well, it's new and we have a record out and we're promoting that. And we want to put that into people's heads. And the way to do that is to make sure to play those songs at the gigs. And so with the band all being on the same page with that, at least as a, you know, a meta direction, it makes it a whole lot easier. And that, and we saw that with Bitter Pill over the summer, too, as new songs are being written, some of which will be out on this this record when it when it comes out shortly here. We were adding them to the set and then we learned, you know, they became part of the show, even though they weren't on a record that anybody could buy. They could hear them at the gigs. And now they'll that's actually generated some demand for what this next record will be. And of course, there's some songs on the record nobody's heard yet. And that's a good thing because then they'll want to come to the gigs and hear them, you know, this summer, et cetera, et cetera. Assuming we have gigs this summer, which this makes total sense fun. to me because the whole band is on the same page that we have an objective yeah. to promote our new record. But it, so I mean, even if still, we play a song. Yeah. You know, even if some of the songs on the record are not quite getting that remarkable response yet, or you know it's developing, or maybe not at all, maybe never. The band yeah. is somewhat on the same page. Like we have an objective. We have to. We right. have to tell people about this music and show people this music. Yeah. So that's. It doesn't mean it's perfect though. It could fall right. apart. Like in in our fling Slack chat the other day, Russ was like, "Dave, you know, you you really." And we've got everybody in the band writing songs now. Uh, you're missing out. You should be writing songs. I'm like, you know me as an opinionated jackass. Are you <laughs> sure that you want to encourage this? Someone with with no with very little experience uh, bringing in songs that we all know are going to get jettisoned for the better ones that you guys write. And also no real currently no real desire to be participating in the songwriting at that point. I'm happy. I love participating in the arrangement of the songs and all of that stuff. I mean, it like, I love that, but I just don't like, I don't conceive of songs. It's just not a thing. And so yeah. are you, you sure you want me doing that? Like you, sure, you want to pick at that scab? You sure about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> but yes, so, we are all on the same page and it's, it's wonderful. And it's, it's helpful when, when everybody in the band understands the thematic direction of things. I don't mean everybody's songs need to sound the same, but when everybody has their eyes open and their ears open and understands, okay, whatever I'm bringing in as, you know, a songwriter needs to fit in this other canon of material. And, and that could be something completely different, um, but it still needs to be fit in the sound of the band, like if if somebody brought in a you know a death metal tune into Bitter Pill, well, okay, but there there is a banjo player on stage, right? And and you know the, our guitar player has sounds that sound like X, Y, and Z. So you know, and our our bass player mostly plays a cello as a bass. And so like, what is what is a death metal song going to sound like when it's put through the Bitter Pill machine? It'd probably be friggin' amazing. But I probably wouldn't be what death metal fans would call like classic death metal either. It's gonna, it's going to sound like Bitter Pill playing death metal, and that's going to be true of any band. And having your eyes open enough to understand that, yeah, okay, like these songs that that any songwriter is bringing in are going to sound like that band playing that song. That's a good thing. It doesn't mean that we have to play it exactly as our instincts would tell us right out of the gate. You know, if the mm -hmm. songwriters got. And that certainly is true with me as the drummer, perhaps more than any other musician in the band, but I, I can't really speak for everybody, but somebody, will, you know, it happens all the time where somebody brings in a song. I wind up playing whatever is just naturally coming out of me as a reaction to what I'm hearing. And that can change what I play can fundamentally change the way a song comes up across, right? Like if I decide to play double time or half time, 
suddenly this song feels like double time or halftime. It's like there's no getting around it. And so it it takes it takes a collaboration of like the the person who wrote this song saying, well, wait, 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 here's here's what I had in mind. Would you try playing something like this? And, I, you know, I, it, like it's it I can never predict how that's going to come out. Sometimes whatever they had in mind is like as soon as I try it is obviously perfect. Right. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes what comes out of me initially is perfect. And then sometimes it's some something else that either is a mix of those two or a third band member chimes in and says, well, wait, uh, I'm hearing this. Neither one of those things is is working. But what if you did this? And so the parts that I play are very rarely solely written by me. Um, and it, it, you know, you have to have that door open. You have to know that this is how these things are going to go. But that's part of the process that I love because it's, yeah. it's that whole sum of the parts thing, right? And, so, and actually being no, part I, of that's cool. I get it. And actually, I'm going to take this conversation to a slightly dovetailed position nice. here. So have you noticed, like, there's a lot of really passionate arguments about, about things like, you know, cover bands should play songs in the same key as the original or, or, you know, don't, don't even try, or, you know, the goal of the cover band is to, is to reproduce things as close as, as you can to, sure. to the original. Yeah. I mean, you've seen those arguments, right? Yep. I actually think maybe it's this place I'm in, you know, like I actually think it's better to be good at taking a cover song keeping the essence of it so it's still that recognizable cover song, but playing it as you want to play it. So if you're going to change something entirely and take a death metal song and make it a bluegrass song, that's a, that's not what I'm talking about here. No, that's, I get what you're a, saying. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is, is like for, you know, the average five piece band, you know, do you have to worry about, like, I, I definitely, I definitely don't think you have to play things in the same key as the original. I think you, you know, where, where your singer can sing them is the best place for them. Cause once, once the song's in someone else's hands, it's going to, it's going to sound different anyway. Doesn't right? matter. Yeah. you so that song's going to sound like know, it went through the machine of your band. It's right. that's the filter. That's how it be. Oh so yeah. You drop it a half step, a step, you know, whatever it might be, you know, if it still sounds good and your singer can sing it effectively, then that, I think that's the ultimate litmus. I don't really get that argument. Like, you know, shame on cover bands who can't do things in the original keys. Most artists, especially classic rock artists, are certainly not singing them in the same keys that they originally did them in. So I, I don't, I think that's, that's a, yeah, an it's fine. Point. I went and saw Genesis uh, back in December. I don't know that we ever talked about it. Fantastic no. show. Uh, loved it. Now, I had the benefit of seeing them at the end of the U.S. leg of their tour. I think I saw the second to last night they played here in the U.S. And so I knew what to expect going in. I knew that Phil's, you know, physical uh, problems were going to be very evident. I knew he was going to be walking with a cane and sitting for the show. He never sang. Uh, he never stood and sang. He sat and sang. He never played the drums. I know that, you know, he hasn't been able to play the drums for a decade. I knew his son was going to be playing the drums. And I'd love to take a minute and talk about N Nicholas Collins. That guy at 20 years old is a world-class mm. arena drummer. And I mean, he, he reminded me of, if you watch Phil as he played like on Lamb Lies Down, right? Where he was just the drummer and doing his thing and just sitting back there and totally relaxed and, but playing his butt off and, mm. you know, hitting all these, these, difficult, like, you know, intricate rhythms and parts and fills and all that stuff. And he was just, you know, killing it. That's what Nicholas was all night long. And he held that band together and drove the bus all night long. It was phenomenal to watch. Really That's great. Cool. Yeah. And Phil sounded great, but some of the songs, some of the songs were, you know, a step, two steps. I think one song was even three steps or three wow. half, three half steps. Sorry. Three, you know, a step and a half low. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay, well, but his voice, he sounds like Phil Collins and you know, he's 70 years old. Now he looks like he's mm -hmm. about 85, which is a shame, but uh, you know, it's how it, it's how it is. Yeah. I, I, I had no issue with their decisions to change the key of, of some of those tunes. Like, it's like, yeah. that's fine, man. Like, they're not the Genesis of, of 1970. It, they're like, Genesis. They're, they're Genesis today. It's yeah. fine. Like, if you expected even the Genesis of 
you know, 1991, which is the last time I saw him, I think, or 92, maybe. But, you know, it wasn't that. Uh, but it was still like they, they were able to entertain and it was, it was still those songs. Correct. Played by those guys. Yeah. 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 And did you know that, um, Max Weinberg's son sat in for him for a a part of a Springsteen tour? Mm -mm. Jay Weinberg, who is the drummer for the heavy metal band Slipknot. Oh, no kidding. I didn't realize that they were related. Interesting. Ah. Yep. Yep. And, uh, he, he, so the interesting thing was it, it, you know, it definitely changed the music. It like sure. he was such an aggressive drummer. It was really cool. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I it's We're I, talking about sons of sons of drummers. Sons of drummers. Yeah, man. Or kids of drummers. Yeah. It was yeah. what a when what a wonderful thing for Phil and his son to be on stage together for this tour, which is yeah. not the first time. He's he's played with Phil for a while, ever since Phil and uh Chester Thompson had some sort of falling out, whatever it was, like eight or ten years ago or something like that. But um yeah. It's, it was, it was, I love that show. It was great, but it wasn't, you know, nothing. Well, some things I think were in the original key, but some weren't. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. fine. But I knew it going in. I, you know, I heard from some people that, that had seen the tour early on and, and did not know what to expect. And, and they, th- those people seemed more upset than the, pe- than those of us that saw it toward the end and sort of had, had the, uh, had the veil lifted ahead of time. So upset that it wasn't note for note what they, what they bought on a record 40 years ago. And you know, that Phil wasn't able to be Phil running around the stage doing his antics. I mean, he was still very entertaining. He was, he was Phil Collins. He was cheeky and funny and all of that good stuff. And he still could get the crowd into the palm of his hand because he has whatever that magic is that he knows how to do that. And it was great, but you know, it wasn't, it just wasn't the same, but that's, it's okay. <laughs> it's how it is. That's the if that's the band you want to see, that's the band you're going to get. Yeah, I mean, again, you are a fan of the band, and you're not a fan of them to stay in one place for their entire career because that's not reality, right? That so too. you're yeah, you're growing old with them, and you know they're adapting. They wrote these gems. They wrote these magical things. Yeah, and they've you know it's not really any different than you know, Dylan, Springsteen, you know, Petty, any, any of the, any of these artists who reinterpret their own material, do it acoustic, do it slow, do a fast song, re, you know, re, reimagine it. It's, that's the art you're buying into the artist and you're asking the artist to kind of take you on a ride of their view of the world, given where they are in the world. And that's where Phil Collins is in the world right now. That's right. right. That's right. So, yeah. 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 So anyway, the, the, wrap that all up. I just, I was thinking about those conversations that I've been, these threads that I've been watching where, there are these kind of purist ideologies about what a cover band should be and as close to the record as possible. And, you know, it's live music, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a visual medium. It's not the record. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, you're there to entertain. So whatever you need to do to make it the most entertaining thing as possible. I don't think that, I don't think audiences that are going out to listen to cover music, going out dancing, are, are given a damn that it's, whether it's in the same key or, you know, whether it's a couple clicks faster or slower. Well, maybe, if you're dancing, maybe a couple clicks slower, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I think it's I think, like, I, are, is it good? That's, that's the ultimate, is it really good? And are people digging it? That's, that's the only question you got to ask. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't think there's any one correct answer to this. I, I think a band that, you know, especially if it's a tribute band, and they are looking to, you know, to match, are different. match the record as closely as they can. Like, there's nothing wrong with that either. But accepting what it is that's best for your band to do and then go do that. I think that's yeah. the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know, man. I don't have all the answers. If you folks have any answers, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to know. I'd love to hear if you are... What what your thoughts are about playing gigs right now and, uh, you know, indoor gigs, if that's where you are in the world, that indoor gigs are the only option like it is for me and, and that sort of thing. I'm just I'm curious what uh, where everybody else is landing. There's there's no wrong answers here, at least not to us. No, no judgment from us. There you go. I've learned a lot from what how musicians have viewed everything going through COVID. I mean, I, I thought I thought my view into this was gospel. Right. And then <laughs> listening to people that I respect or, or who just state an eloquently stated position, be careful about thinking, you know, everything, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, man. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned, I've learned how much little I know. I've told you more than I know. There you go. Yeah. 
we're, we're, we're all, we're all treading through this and uh, yeah. learning from each other. So yeah. anyway, Dave, I'm wishing you an awesome 2022. Let's hope that, you know, life finds its way back to cool things again. And we're talking about great gig experiences a lot this year. I, I can't wait for that to happen again, man. Yeah, absolutely. Send the side. Good luck with all you. the new music. Thanks. Yeah. I'm excited about this. It's, it's, it's good. It's everything. It's like creativity. It's, there's so much happening in my Go world. Get yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Uh, that's what we got, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Check us out on Facebook, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. Always be performing. Always. Happy New Year, everybody. See you next time. Happy New Year. Yep.